This episode of the podcast is supported by Audible. You can download and listen to the world's best storytelling. I use it all the time to and from work. You can listen to audiobooks, original series and more on their free app. To get your free 30-day subscription, which includes a free book, click on the link in our show notes and enjoy. Hey folks, welcome to the podcast. Today I had a great lady called Sue Uniman come in and speak to me on the podcast. She's currently Chief Transformation Officer at MediaCon and she's author of a bunch of really cool books, the latest one being The Glass Wall and she's currently writing another one. Not sure what the title is but it's on diversity. And so we had a great conversation. We looked at whether the current initiatives on diversity are working, how they're measured, and what we can do to make them work better. Really cool conversation. I hope you enjoy it. Hey, it's Lewis. Welcome to the podcast. Enjoy our conversations anytime, anywhere. Cool, we're live. Right. See, so, thanks for joining me. Well, thank you for having me. Pleasure, pleasure. All the way from North West London. Yeah. All the way. All the way. Come all the way from uh, Charles Hill. (laughs) Nice. So um, I know you've written some interesting books and all that stuff. And Mm. I wanted to talk really for the chunk of the podcast about diversity and where we're at, what's working, what's not, what we can do and stuff. But before we dive in, what is your background? My day job is I'm Chief Transformation Officer at Mediacom, which is the biggest media planning and buying agency. Biggest and best, I say. Biggest and best. Of course. Media planning and buying agency um, in the UK. So we have clients like Direct Line Group, Tesco, like Sky, um, Cancer Research, Universal, theatrical movies so a big range of clients of all different types actually NCS Um, and I've been there for a ridiculously long (laughs) amount of time so I joined a tiny company called the media business which was a buying shop in 1990 so it will be 30 years um, next summer obviously I was a child of course when I joined obviously straight from uni well well I I, I believe (laughs) I I probably about you know at still at primary school I think oh, it must, right, have, must yeah. have been surely surely <laughs> no I wasn't I'd been around actually but um the uh the company just grew and grew and grew and then we're, we were acquired by a company called Mediacom yeah. um, and we've now grown so we when I joined we built about 44 million pounds worth of billings of buying our clients money and now we're 1.9 billion in the UK so Brilliant. it's a lot of organic growth and it's a global network so I've stayed in the same place for a very long time must but, have changed but it's amazing, changed mate, enormously yeah. the jobs sort of technically changed enormously I mean our role is to grow our clients business and that was true in 1990 and it's true in 2019 and our role within that is to really understand people and consumers and understand how to make them kind of fall in love with clients brands and that hasn't changed because people hasn't changed but the techniques that we use obviously yeah. are so much more complicated and diverse and include creating content and um, search as well as placing advertising. So Amazing. my role is to make sure that Mediacom in the UK and also our clients are ahead of all of the changes and transformations that they need to be. Cool. And have you always done transformation? No, it's that's sort of, that's I took that title in uh, 2017. Before that, I was strategy and okay. planning. But probably my thing was always about transformation really anyway so um, we now have Jeff as our very good chief strategy officer in the UK and I'm um, chief transformation officer so we work very closely together cool how did you get into it all oh that's a good question um I was going to do law so I I graduated with a history degree I had a place to do a um, law conversion course okay. um, at the Inner Temple and I had a year off in between I got a bit bored and I got bored I was um, making cakes at a cafe in Oxford <laughs> called Georgina's right. I'm very good at making cakes actually nice. is it still around now? Um, Georgina's is still there actually <laughs> yeah. and when I left they did ask me to make a stock for them and they put them in the freezer but I don't think they can Amazing. still have some of my cakes are you still baking? Left. I still bake. We need to see you on Great British Bake Off at some point. Uh, well, yeah, I'm, yeah, maybe. I um, don't know if I can stand the stress of the tent. But um, uh, I got, I just got bored doing that and I wanted to earn a bit of money and so I got a job in advertising. And then with the first pay rise that they gave me kind of six months after I joined, I could afford to leave home. Oh, okay. And if I'd done the law conversion course, I would have had to stay living at home probably for another two or three years. Okay, right. And just at that age, it just felt like a no-brainer. You're ready to. So yeah. I absolutely just fell into advertising. Um, Amazing. And it was a very different industry. It was very Mad Men like when I, I joined say, as well. Yeah. We've seen real 
disruption of the industry by the media independence, which is where I joined in 1990. Yeah, yeah. And um, now I have probably one of the best jobs out there. Nice. That's awesome. And but I could have been a judge by now, probably. So, you know, More fun? But, uh, mm. I don't know. You must have had a great, <laughs> really fun, great career doing what you're doing. Well, I, yes. Uh, yeah, you know, I love what, I do, what I'm doing. But I think, you know what? It's not any way, I think, the job. I think how much you enjoy your job is to do with the culture of the people that you work with and the culture of the company. And my experience has been that, um, you know, a lot of people ask for advice about what careers they should be going into and they think a lot about their choices. And my view is, is that your work life balance your job satisfaction completely depends on the culture of the company you're at and it might even be in some companies the team yeah, that you're true. in within that company and I don't know if you, you know because it's more your ex- area of expertise but you kind of don't know that till you get there so businesses can talk all they like about their culture and the and the fruit and sweets all day long but it's actually about how kind people are to each other and how much they help each other and if it's a sort of culture where you get ahead by pushing down everyone else for me that was not a good culture to be in that was more of the experience in my first advertising agencies and when I joined the media business and now Mediacom the culture is about helping each other to succeed and that actually is what makes the job fun. It's great you never know until you join the funny thing with interviewing is it's it's really like speed dating and it's you end up so you meet i don't know x number of people for an hour they make a judgment on you you make a judgment on them and you decide to spend um five days basically your whole life with them yeah i mean when you're deciding to get married you don't do it you don't decide after one hour right yeah. You go out with them, you just, oh, should I want to get married, yeah. and et cetera, et cetera. So it's a funny, it's a funny thing. Yeah, it's 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 suboptimal as a process, isn't it? Uh, yeah, 100%. Yeah. I mean, you can use psychometrics and, you know, all and of these things. people do, but I'm things. not sure any of that makes... It gives you a better chance of making, you know, Probably, the more... But you don't, you can't psychometric the company you're joining. So so that no, works perhaps one on way. the candidates, yeah. but, yeah, yeah. you and don't it, get to go, can I, can I psychometric the people that I'm going to be working with, please? No, you don't get the, yeah, it's true. You don't get the opportunity. Yeah. And it's not until, you know, things go wrong or you go through tough moments, you know, when you're really in the trenches with someone, yeah. That's that the real know. kind of, you yeah. know, what they're about comes out. Um, and, and, and more and more, and when I meet people, senior execs that are thinking about leaving or you, you kind of delve into to what their motivations are, and always people related. Yeah. If someone's changed or they're not getting on with their team. You know, th- those kinds of things. That's what people say. That people say people leave managers, they don't leave Yeah, businesses. absolutely, yeah, yeah, yeah. Over and over again. I mean, it's funny, like a, lo- a lot of people think people move for more money and, and yeah. money's much further down the list than people think. Mm. It's always the people aspect mm. and the culture and stuff like that. So as well as me being having been at Mediacom for a long time, I've probably got about 25, 30 colleagues that I've worked with for more than 20 years. So there's a lot of people that are still hanging around, which again is a sign of, so you know, a lot of Yeah, so there's a, a lot about culture. the place. Yeah. Definitely. Yeah. How did your book and your interest in diversity and stuff come about? Well, it's connected really. So I, um, I'd i written a previous book, which was about marketing called uh, Tell the Truth, Honesty is Your Most Powerful Marketing um, Tool, which came out in 2012. And in about, must have been about 20... 14, 15, I started thinking about writing another book. Um, and originally I was going to write a book that was a follow-up to the first one, to tell the truth. Okay. So I went to my um, then Amir boss, now my um, global COO, who's um, a man called Nick Lawson, who I've worked with for 29 of those 30 <laughs> years that I'm coming up to. And I said to him, first book was published by an American publisher. I wanted to do a follow-up about our clients. So I said, you know, would Mediacom consider self-publishing that f- for me rather than taking it out because it's going to be more of a PR piece than a critical yeah. critical piece yeah and he said just to my surprise he said Nick he's Nick said um he said yeah he said actually we would he said but I've been thinking about you and that's not the book you should write you should write a book about women and work and when he said it my initial reaction was well I don't know Sheryl Sandberg's just published Lean In I like bits of Lean In but it's very much a book for extroverts and I am I am very much an introvert I mean I I do my best but I'm you know by nature an introvert and if I'd read that when I was in my early 20s I honestly would have just gone back to bed and and, you know (laughs) pulled the covers up it's like it's so lean in put your hand up do this do that So I thought, well, you know, I don't agree with all the advice in it. And it's also quite American. And, you know, she's got this amazing, she goes, she goes you know, phone your contacts list. Well, you know, who's, who's got that contact list? So I um, thought about that. And then I looked at Mediacom at the time. So my UK business at the time 
we had um, quite a small exco, senior exco, of which I was one. And four out of the five client-facing people on the exco were women. And three out of those four were working part-time because of having kids, including me. And, you know, it was a it's highly competitive business, under, undergoes enormous competitive kind of, uh, you know, scrutiny and attack, if you like. Yeah. People are always pitching for our clients because we've got lots of clients. But also, it's 24-7 business. I mean, if we, if we have told a client that a spot is definitely going to go out in Britain's Got Talent and it doesn't go out for whatever reason, no client goes, I'll tell you what, I'll, I'll wait till 9, 9.30 <laughs> yeah. Monday morning before. It's like, it's, we're on Straight it the on. whole time. Yeah. On Christmas Day, Boxing Day, someone's, you know. So if I think if you'd said to most organisations, so what we'll do in that kind of business is we'll have four of the five top people will be women, three out of the four of them be working part time. It's fine, isn't it? Most businesses would go, no. Now, it had happened at Mediacom organically. Everybody had been promoted from within. Everybody had just worked their way through, up through the ranks. And I just looked at our, co- our competition. And then I sort of, just kind of like I looked up, looked up, looked around. Just and talking and, about the power Yeah, and looked at everyone else and looked at some media owners, the media owners that we work with. And that kind of uh, senior level of women wasn't anywhere. And it so happened at the time that my CEO then was Karen Blackett, who's now okay, our yeah. chair and WPP country lead and also advises to advises the government on diversity and inclusiveness and is on helps Megan and uh, Harry with their nice. charitable trust. And uh, she is not only a woman, she's a, a black woman who's a single mom. It, it is sort of isn't possible that given the number of women that there are in the population, that, that all of the talented women had happened to rock up 124 Theobalds Road. I mean, I'd like to think so. I'd like to think we're very good, but it's kind of statistically not possible. Yeah, yeah. So I went to my co-author, wave the book, the glass wall, <laughs> um, Catherine Jacob, who is uh, one of the very few women CEOs of media owners. So there are a tiny handful of women CEOs at media owners. She runs Pearl and Dean, the cinema company. Yeah. And I said, um, what do you think's going on? And she said, I don't know what's going on. Why has Mediacom been different for everyone else? So we set out to find out. So we went, just started interviewing people. We've got quant research in the book as well. Awesome. And um, we ended up with The Glass Wall. Nice, nice. And how long did it take you to compile everything, write it? And- well, the, the longest part of the process <laughs> was finding a publisher. So I, 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 I was very aware that you can self-publish. Yeah. But I wanted to work with a, a publisher, um, you know, to edit us and, you know, kind yeah. of give us discipline. And it took us a while to find a profile. And so... So probably during the year that we were looking for profile, we were doing the interviewing and kind yeah. of forming our point of view and our perspective. And then it takes about six months to write, pull everything together, finish writing it. And then um, publishing is quite slow. So another six months to write. So about two years in total. Amazing. And yeah. this was all UK focused kind of interviews? No, and da- the mostly UK. But we have uh, stories in the book from around the world, America, kind of Australia. Right. Um, and the research is the UK, the quant research is UK, US and Russia. Okay. So we did working populations of those three countries to make some comparison nice so are the current diversity initiatives working no. i mean the gender pay gap went back year on year so from the first year to the second year um it actually w- went backwards overall and um what's happened since the book was published so what's happened just just to remind everyone so it was published in 2016 okay is an enormous amount of raised profile for diversity and inclusiveness an enormous amount of initiatives um but actually, I can announce <laughs> <laughs> that we've just been commissioned to write a follow-up oh, to amazing, the book amazing. with um, Bloomsbury Publishing, which is very exciting. Congratulations. Thank you. Very excited. We're now writing it. So nice. everything's so your material is everything is material. Um, Absolutely. It's about what what needs to happen next. Because I don't em- empirically, if things are changing, they're changing very, very, very slowly. And I think in some examples, they are actually moving backwards. There are trends. So although everybody is thinking and talking about diversity and inclusiveness much more, there are mitigating trends going on in the work environment that are actually not helping with senior women women being promoted. Um, And I think there's a lot as well of emphasis on this is the job of HR, whereas in any good culture, it's the job 
of everybody in management. Before before I yeah. started writing the book, if someone said to me, you know, MediaCom's been very successful. It was a tiny company when you joined. We've had exponential growth since then. Why yeah. is that? And my answer would have been diversity, the diversity of senior management. Um, and not only diverse in terms of how we look and where we're from, yeah. kind of of origin originally, because we're, you know, and, and indeed LGBT, all of that kind of thing, but also diversity of thinking. And one of the things, one of the, things that we talk about people obsess too much about cultural fit and what happens if you are an employer and you're looking for someone to fit your culture is that you get the same culture Absolutely, repeating itself yeah. over and over yeah. again it limits diversity in the hiring process for sure and we yeah. we talk instead about avengers assemble so the idea that what you want in a great team is you yeah. want who are different but who can work together you do not want a room full of incredible hulks but an incredible hulk and an iron man and a, and a scarlet which great definitely yeah um and that's what had happened at mediacom and i think that's why it was successful. without without trying so it wasn't contrived it was it was organic but know, i think just... it, it, it when you say without trying what we were trying to do was win and because yeah. so because we were so competitive winning pitches and things because we were so competitive we said let's employ the people that were talented and one of the first things that i did um first press interviews we gave for the book for the glass wall was with um joe good on radio london who was oh, yeah. brilliant and she had a an email an email flooded in as a question right. <laughs> and um she said uh, the email said look you know you've said sue and catherine you've said that it's, there's a glass wall for women at work and i can explain a bit about what yeah, that yeah. is if you, if you like but she said wouldn't you agree that it's a concrete wall for for um black women at work and she said did you know in this email she said did you know there's only one media agency run by a, a black woman and i said yes i do because that's my she was in my chair that's, that's right. my that's one of my bosses karen yeah. and then i sort of thought about it and i thought but you know we didn't promote karen because she's a woman because she's black or because she's a single woman. we promoted her because she's really good at her job yeah, yeah so does that mean that if she'd worked elsewhere or if i'd worked elsewhere we wouldn't have got promoted despite the fact that we were good at our job because the thing about gender diversity and there's a lot, a lot of intersectionality now, which yeah. makes some people lean back because they feel it's too complicated to deal with. Yeah. But the thing about gender overall, encompassing women of colour and women who are lesbian and disabilities, et cetera, et cetera, is that women are not a minority. And yet we talk about them in the workplace as though they are. And yet, no, there's th- bit th- about 30 million of them in the UK. And it just... Beggars belief statistically, given that women have been had a full share in the workforce for sixty years, yeah, yeah. that none of them have organically risen up to the top anywhere else. Well, so what you're saying to sum up the current initiatives that people and firms are doing just aren't working. And then what you're seeing now is... But they're a, working a bit. A little bit, but nothing yeah. nothing outstanding. No. And then I see it, and I don't know if you see yeah. it, but I, start, I see now a, a bit of a backlash towards mm. um, these diversity initiatives. Yeah. Um, a lot of the time, white men who feel that they've been marginalised, they can't get the promotion... Um, they're not getting on the short lists and yeah. stuff. Do you see, are you seeing much of that? Yeah, so I think there are two, I think if you're a straight white man in the workplace at the moment, there's two sorts of reactions that are, that are around. One is, you know, largely, largely the good guys yeah. who are going, I really want to do something to help, but let me tell you, the, the risk of me saying or doing the wrong thing is so high now. Oh yeah. It's, it's yeah. career destroying. I'm just going to sit here quietly and hope, and wish, wish everyone well, but I... <laughs> I'll, sh- I'll, sh- I'll shut up, shall I? <laughs> yeah, right? So yeah. that's one thing. And that's not helpful. Yeah. And then the other thing, particularly bearing in mind that it is still white men who hold the roles who are powerful, they have the power, is the men that are kind of upset and worried and frightened, who are feeling like they're not wanted, who are having a very bad day on International Women's Day, which is now massively celebrated everywhere because they're feeling like nobody wants them, who if they miss out to a role or a promotion to a woman, you know, I don't, obviously, I have no idea what's going on in every instance, but it may be preferable to think that you've missed out because you're a man than because you weren't good enough. I don't know, maybe maybe that level, but then... More comfortable thing to think. The more more important level is like young people, right? Like grads or school leavers. So just just people in the in in society, and so that the big danger um, you find and, and this backlash, yeah. it's a, it's at all levels. Yeah, it is. It's at people all that I don't know if I look at my social circle, maybe I'm too optimistic, but I don't, there's no sexism or yeah. racism or homophobia. People have friends from everywhere, and yeah. we don't really care. Yep. 
you know but it gets it obviously gets into society somewhere yeah and and i think the danger with some of these these initiatives which haven't really worked so well is that you don't really want it getting in at, at, at the early age you no, want people to feel because the whole, the whole point of this is it's about fairness right it's so about equality fairness, it's means, about inclus- inclusion it, yeah, well, the inclusion yeah. initiative shouldn't leave out straight white men yeah, it should be inclusive of everyone. It should be really yeah. clear. Yeah, yeah. That's yeah. even if people feel, and there is a there is a school of thought that goes, oh, well, look, tough, suck it up, because you, oh, you've got to compete with the other half of the human race. <laughs> well, that's just not helpful. No. And what no. what do people think is going to be the reaction to that? And yeah, no, certainly, I I know a couple of and women who've got teenage sons, right? Um, and one of whom in particular said to me, he came home from International Women's Day at school. And, and said, that's the worst day I've ever spent. He said, nobody wants people like me. Really? Um, and I've heard another story about, uh, you know, a very, this is a, this is a public school young man who um, was doing a, a kind of law degree who was at the point of tears because he thought he had no prospects which is, again, not what happens if you talk to anyone who works in the legal profession yeah. um, as a woman. Who, yeah, yeah. It, it's, that's yeah. not the picture. And so, and you know, look, I read something today. This month is an anniversary of the first College of Surgeons for Women in America. So it opened up in the 18-somethings. I can't remember the exact day. And the man who ran it, because it was a man, naturally, um, said, well, there's around 40,000 surgeons operating in America today. 20,000 of them have got to make room for women, right? Okay. Is that what happened? No. How many surgeons are there operating in America today? No more, idea. More than 40,000, <laughs> right? <laughs> so it's not a zero-sum game. Yeah, yeah. It's yeah. a growth business. And if you are in business, you will grow if you take a proper approach to diversity, right? So it's not well, there's only room for so many people on this board. It's let's grow the board, let's grow the business, let's let, let's add diversity to it. I mean, the the interesting statistics, I think, and there must be some new ones about to come out, are yeah. the FTSE board figures, because they've been celebrating the growth of uh, the number of women as a proportion on those boards, but most of those women are non-executive directors. Yeah, yeah. So I think it was 30% was the last figure, which was last year, on the FTSE 100. Um, do you know what the uh, and that was uh, you know and that was that was up from 2015 when we wrote the book, uh, it was it was 26 percent so that's grown. Yeah. 2015 the number of executive women on so actually working for the company on the FTSE 100 was just two percent. Guess how much many there were last year of executive women on the FTSE 100. Probably very similar. It was two percent. Yeah. Yeah. It had, it had popped up to three percent I believe right. during <laughs> during 2016 and then. Rattle back down again. So the interesting thing and, I think here yeah. is then you've got so you've got two things. So c- clearly, whatever we've been trying to do recently hasn't worked so well. Well, it's working slowly. It's slowly, and then maybe in some areas it's not working. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's sort of it's, it's alienating some people. And it's alienating some, and, and that's always a curious thing. Like a lot of people try and justify diversity by making a business case for it. Yeah, really, it's like it's just, it's society's better if it, society's that's fairer that's definitely true yeah so it's, it's always i've always found it interesting why people are trying to make a business case for it rather than just a case for a better society so so that leads you on and it'd be interesting to talk about about the measurement of diversity because mm-hmm. it's quite one-dimensional which is interesting but but to start with if it's not working what should we be doing differently I think it's really yeah. simple. I think it's about it's a cultural issue. It's about inclusiveness. It's about belonging. And you know, we're we're, at, we're writing the book at the moment, so I've, yeah. I've got seventy five thousand words to write by the thirty first of March. <laughs> They're not all written yet. Fine. So with my co authors, um, Catherine, and also um, uh, Mark Edwards, because we thought because this book is aimed at men as well, definitely, you know, we're going right. to have a, a man join us as an author. And um, it's it, we're still working through our arguments, but I think it might just be really simple. It's about ensuring that it's everybody responsibility so outsourcing it to a head of HR I think that's a schoolboy error so a lot a lot of firms do outsource it to people they even outsource it to headhunters oh oh a I, lot, I you get, get blamed so I, not you personally yeah but, yeah but you I will get told uh the headhunters couldn't find anybody so I, I get asked and, and this is um and this goes kind of goes against my my own values and I'm I'm into equality yep. um inclusiveness etc when I get asked specifically to find a certain type of person goes against what you I want believe to find the best person for the job. Best person. I, you know, I, all I care about is that the individual and the company match and it works well and they stay for 30 years and they do a great <laughs> job right 
don't really care. But is anything who... ever going to change if if nobody takes if nobody goes looking for? So so I think personally, um, from my, my own view, the measurement, the way that that diversity is measured in in the public mm. domain is too one dimensional. It's kind of like uh, you know people measure their health on you can't measure your health on calories and weight. It doesn't tell you anything mm. about how healthy you are. Mm. So a lot of time in uh, diversity, it's measured um, numbers and pay. Yeah. It doesn't really tell you anything about um, what's going on in society. And hence, we haven't really seen a huge amount change. And you see a little bit of some people in society being alienated, and which is not a good thing for society yeah. either. So for me, really, the big thing is stigma. Um, so if you look yeah. at... You know, if you look at uh, who looks after the kids, for example, yeah, I'd say I don't know what the actual stats are, but let's say it's ninety-five percent of the women yeah. in a relationship look after the kids. Yeah, you mentioned it yourself. Um, you didn't mention any guys, but you said three of your, including you, of your leadership team were part time. Oh yeah, I'm assuming yeah. that that three were women. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I mean, we do we do have some men now, but at the time yeah. it was, at the time it was women. Only women. Yeah. yeah, and most of the, and even now it, it's Mostly, women, yeah. and and so you know there's a big stigma attached to guys looking after kids. You know, Still, you, oh, massively. You know, mm. if you, if, you, if I go to my school reunion and the guys are like, "Oh, what are you up to? I'm I'm, I'm a stay-at-home dad," mm. you can imagine the reaction. Mm. Um, paternity paternity leave and paternity pay is not yeah. equal either. No, and and, so, and men are not taking it. They don't take it because of the stigma. Yeah. I mean, I had a friend, two friends, or one one friend of mine, um, he was able to take six months, six months paternity full pay. So the economics worked out for him mm. and his his mm. wife. And uh, and he said he said look the look the look on people's faces. Um, and in fact, his boss said, "Really? Are you sure you want to take some paternity? You know, you want to take that long? It might affect your progression opportunities, your career. You know, all of those types mm. of things." So for me, if you really want, if you want to kind of really get down into it and make it fairer, because for me it's about a quality of opportunity rather than a quality of outcome. Quality of opportunity makes for a really fair, open society. And if I have the opportunity to stay at home and look after my kids if I want to, and my wife has the opportunity to go and pursue a full-time career mm-hmm. if she wants to, mm-hmm. then I think we'll start to get to a better place. Okay. So... What does that mean for... And so I think the reason that people make business arguments is because it's within the remit of business to change that. Society feels like a very big nut to crack. Do you think it's a... So, so oh, interestingly, I read in our trade press today that the um, government is uh, tendering for a campaign about getting rid of the gender pay gap. Right. So it's going to be a, a, some sort of creative advertising campaign so I was just Actually, thinking about it so I think morning. so you're, you're almost thinking you need you need you need behaviour change or cultural change for the whole of the country uh, definitely yeah because the thing at the moment it feels like contrived like you know when someone asks me um, okay so I want uh, so when I submit a long list yeah uh, and sometimes companies in the UK ask me to sign up to this so yeah. if I don't produce X number a 50-50 list um, so 50, it's even split also with BAME or yeah, FEMA, yeah, whatever yeah, it might be yeah. The very fact that someone's asking me to contrive my list doesn't really make me feel comfortable. And also, I can't think why it's, it's, it's not a fair way to go about hiring. And so I think there's better things you can do to get the same outcome. And the outcome should be a fair society, mm-hmm. you know, equality of opportunity. You know, it's very different in Scandinavia. You, you worry of this. So, so everyone uh, yeah, always yeah, says, if, yeah. you, if you want a husband who's going to support you in your career, marry someone Swedish. <laughs> So maybe it's maybe it's cultural. Maybe it's upbringing. I think there, I think there is a cultural. Um, thing, yeah. There's a lot. There's, I think my point is, there's so many things yeah. that go into it. You know, it's not so one-dimensional. Um, it's like it's like health and fitness. You know, um, I might be like considered overweight on the BMI mm. scale, mm. but actually, you know, it's all muscle. I'm super yeah, fit. My yeah. cardio is amazing, and my yeah, heart rate's yeah. great. There's just a lot of things that go into it, and yeah. so I think with with measuring diversity. It needs to be multi-layered. Okay. And then once you start really understanding what's going on in society, then you can make society fairer and better. Um, the thing with the quality of outcome, which the conversations tend to end up leaning to, is um, you, you never achieve a quality of outcome ever. It will never, ever be achieved because people have different strengths and traits. Yeah. And, you know, we start on the 100 meter line and you're quicker than me, you're going to beat me genetics yeah. training whatever it might be well i mean cer- certainly um something that somebody said to me who's he's like a non-exec chair of a number of boards 
and he said he was interviewing for a CEO role for one of them and it wasn't a question of a 50-50 split list the short list was three women and one man but he noticed as he as they went through the interviews that all the, 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 the for the opening question which is what have you done that you're proud of nice easy opening question you know <laughs> yeah. in the last two three uh, years you know everyone well everyone should have an answer for that right no, absolutely um he said the women were going we did this we did that and the man was going i did this i did that and he realized and it, but only yeah. in the conversation with the rest of the panel afterwards yeah yeah that he had therefore discounted the woman's agency in it because she'd said we and it was the other women on the panel who went no 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 no, no that, that's just how women talk and you almost kind of he, and he said he uh, he wanted to ring them up and go <laughs> you know you need to say I and it, you know I think there's this sort of meme for the book which is kind of you know when a, when a woman says we she means I when a man says I it probably means they <laughs> yeah yeah no you're right you're right um, and it's those sorts yeah. of things and you that's see, education I think, you maybe. see I think you can as a, as a, in your kind of day job that's the kind of thing you can we can coach people coach yeah, and yeah. help people and with. we do yeah I yeah. mean so that's so, th- so that's why I think you know you've got to go right even to you know my kids are at school they're super yeah. young and I'm trying to teach them these kind of things right how to communicate effectively yeah how to learn how to think it's a real that's a real gl- glass wall thing though so so the reason we called it the glass wall and not the glass ceiling as far as gender was concerned was because the glass ceiling implies it happens towards the end of your career when you're like reaching the top whereas the glass wall can happen all of the time it can be your first day in a new job it can be a change of boss in your current job and and things have changed and it's a communication barrier it's it's a you think you're speaking the same language that you're but you're not and one of the biggest ones as far as gender is concerned and I don't know obviously your little girls but (laughs) I think this, this seems so strong in women versus men and you know everything's a spectrum right yeah but um it's the showing off thing that the you know i don't know little girls just still don't get encouraged to show off in the same way as little boys do and however you behave as parents you know they're you know yours are very little they're still your little girls but yeah. they're about to go off to you know you're also about to go off to big school it's like it's 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 the not all your influence anymore <laughs> yeah. it's 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 the it's the big soup of of culture and um i mean to this to this day i work with women who would do anything for their business so they will work weekends they will say no 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 don't give me a pay rise give it to the rest of the team they will you know support the the company and the only thing they won't do is show off about their work. And when you say that to them, yeah. they get quite upset because, in terms of fairness, women have a this seem to have this t- deep innate thing of, but surely you should notice if I've done good work. And the answer is, is your boss is busy, and and if yeah. he's a really good boss or she's a really good boss, you then you're right, she will she will notice. But if she's doing a million things, and in in the today's economic climate, we're all doing a million things then the the thing that sticks in your head is that person and largely often it's it's traditionally a man who's going yeah no i solved that huge problem remember that huge problem i i solved that whereas women are kind of just going around solving problems but not shouting about it yeah no it's Um, probably yeah probably true but then the the other thing is you see it in my girls but it's important to develop people's strengths yeah a lot of people focus on these weaknesses i so agree with this should be shouting or yeah just you know make sure your strengths are amazing yeah I practice totally your agree. strengths so much training is improve your areas of weakness i've been on so much training to improve my areas <laughs> of weakness and i realized at a certain point that they weren't improving at all <laughs> all that was happening was that the energy that i could have put put into my areas of strength which are many i have yeah, to say yes, i'm sure yeah. was being wasted <laughs> on trying to sort out areas of weakness which other people had strengths in and I, it, it's again, it's that hideous sort of idea that everybody's got to be the same rather than complementing each other instead of competing. It, yeah, it's, yeah. It's, the thi- the it makes thing- no sense, doesn't no, it? No, no, absolutely. And in a good team, you have different traits yeah. and strengths and, and so forth. So, but, the, we, but people like to control things and they like people that are like them. Yeah. And I understand that as well. Yes, so I do true. understand how, you know, if, if, if someone were to go to you and obviously it's your business, but if someone was to go to someone and go, Pete, we're going to promote you, but you've got to find a number two who's as good as you and then we'll promote you. And then Pete is naturally going to think, well, I know I'm really good at my job, right? Because they're promoting me. So if I find someone who's exactly like me, it's just brilliant, isn't it? Because as, so there is that part of human nature as well. And to say to Pete, 
right, the thing you need to, the very thing you need to do is employ somebody who's the opposite of you. It does, it's not very human nature in a way. No, people like people like themselves. Yeah. You can't get away from it. There's a great book by Daniel Kahneman yeah. called Thinking Fast and Slow, which yeah. is really good. Um, very good, very long. Very, very complicated. long, complicated. <laughs> but it's um, very good. It's great to it. say that you've read it, yeah. even if you haven't. Yeah. I have. Um, yeah. But anyway, the point is, is that we're all, unco- we're all biased, yes, right? Yes, it's all biased. We can't yeah. help it. Yeah. We're human. And yeah. that's how the world works. Yes, it's the, I like you his analogy of, of we think we're the Oval Office, but actually we're the press office. It's kind <laughs> yeah, of like, yeah. not, that the, not that actually the Oval Office meant what it does now what it, when he wrote it. But, yeah. yeah, no, it's true. It's true. We're jumping to immediate decisions yeah. yeah the other the other interesting thing i see also is um and again i'm going to circle back to stigma yeah because i think it's a really stigma's an interesting point yeah a really really key thing um and you're stig- talking about it with regard to men I, I, both so i'll give you some examples so, yeah. so men on the paternity and looking after the kids for sure yeah i think if we because there's an awful lot of men that wants to look after their kids and be a stay-at-home dad and and there's a big stigma yeah let's be honest in society towards that and it doesn't happen so often. They do it brilliantly. Are you watching Motherland? No. Oh, oh! you and your wife have to watch really? Motherland. Okay, on watch. It's so funny. But one of the dads is a stay-at-home dad. Ah, okay, and, right. And they, they do how he fits in and doesn't fit into the other mothers very well. It's very funny. Oh, watch and that. And everybody that I know <laughs> that's watched it goes, they are definitely based it on people I know. <laughs> I've got to watch that. Yeah, got I've to got watch to watch that. that. The, 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 the few, because there's not yeah. many, the few yeah. stay-at-home dads I know... Um, and we talk about strengths. They've yeah. they've met a partner who didn't want to stay at home and look after yeah, the kids, yeah. and they are outstandingly well doing well in their yeah, career. Yeah. And and so that the team so it's a has great enabled team. it, yeah. amazing team enabled yeah. and it. And there are a few of those around, much more than probably for our parents' generation. For sure, yeah. But yeah. it's still a yeah. minority. And so, and I'd like to see that more. There's yeah. also a lot of stigma um, towards women from other women. Um, it's a, mm. a client of mine she, she's an HR director she has I think she's got two, two or three kids and she was dropping she's just finishing maternity leave dropping her uh, her youngest kid at school and, and the women who were mm. at the gate there weren't any men said oh, oh do you want to come for coffee next week and she's oh, like yeah. oh no I'm, I'm going back to yeah. work and one woman turned to her and said oh poor you doesn't your husband earn enough money yeah. she's like uh, actually I want to work yeah um, and so, and so, I think it it works both ways. Like a woman should, or man should, be able to go and work if they want. They should be able to, if you know, if economics and, and all this stuff works yeah. for them, be able to stay at home. Because yeah. in a lot of families, both people need to work. Yeah, let's be honest. Absolutely, no. In the real world, yeah. You know, like in the yeah. real world, you can't yeah. just be a stay at home yeah. dad yeah. or a stay at home mum. So it's all dependent on the circumstances that you're in. But I think. But do you know what the problem with all of this is then? And it's probably going to be a big theme of the book. Is it's about kindness. Yeah. So people do not assume the best intentions of each other, which is a lot of where the oh, I'm frightened to say the wrong thing comes. Well, if you assume the best intentions, if you have the best intentions, we should be able to forgive each other for occasionally getting things wrong because we all get things wrong. Yeah. Um, yeah. But equally amongst that friendship group, and and I was at this the my kids' school. Um, uh, I was one of the few working mothers in the class, so I, I understand that. Because also, you miss out on some of the network stuff that actually you need as a as a working parent anyway. Yeah. And, you know, yeah. I, I had I made some very very good friends, and I lent on my friends who weren't working very heavily, probably more <laughs> than I had any right to, and they were very kind. But there were other mothers who were a bit kind of yeah, a bit dismissive or even perhaps envious but that's yeah. how it exhibited itself yeah, yeah. and the, i mean the other you know if there were if people were, were more actively kind i mean you know you know who your friends are right for sure but yeah. the other and the other aspect of that is what happens essentially if you are a stay-at-home mother um of course you your job is to make yourself redundant and yeah the five ten years when you're you know needed in a different way from kind of like when they're three to when they're 13 yeah yeah goes so fast as a mother and so slowly kind of you know if you like for the for the kid but but career wise that's a long time out of the workplace and I have also now that my kids are, are are grown I've seen that as well and I've seen actually highly educated very um, ambitious women when they had their careers who then stop their careers then go what do I do now and actually if they had to work they would be on the checkout you know little or whatever <laughs> get on yeah. getting on with it yeah, yeah, yeah but not having to work not being needed for school runs and that that's actually a big emotional cost 
in your life as well. Yeah, no, I'm sure, um, absolutely. And I've seen I've seen that difficulty as yeah, well. Yeah, no, that's true. So um, there's an awful lot at, at play there. Yeah, and not, and just like on the diversity metrics, um, I think it's important to make sure it doesn't hurt us because ultimately mm. it's you end up isolating and tallying differences in society and really I mean certainly now you have Brexit and the country seems so so divided and stuff you just need to be careful it doesn't prevent us from realizing how much we all have in common yeah I I think that's very true kind of with the kindest thing my my big thing about culture at work as well and in society in general is um if we you know I think we all agree that it's not very nice for people to be made to feel other or made to feel different or or embarrassed or you know um excluded but we don't all do something about it. We have all been a bystander yeah. in our lives. And if we all today, right now, from this podcast, all agreed, I will never be a bystander again. I will speak up for other people. Then we would get that change that you're talking about. And um, that's within all our power, actually. Definitely. What a beautiful place to end. <laughs> Thank you very much Thank for coming in. Thank you very in. much. Please let me know uh, when the book's coming out. Yeah. Do you have a website that we can... Uh... We have not created a okay, website fine. for the next book. There, there was a Glasswall website, but um, there it, Glasswall is on Instagram. Okay, oh, cool. And uh, I am on Twitter at Sue You. Perfect. So um, I tweet more than I Instagram post. Tweet more than you gram. Yes, I, I tweet more than I gram, but um, <laughs> at Sue you um, um, for updates and news about the book. Awesome. Thank you so much. Really Thank nice you. to speak to you. Good to speak to you. Thank you. Hey, folks, thanks for listening. Don't forget to subscribe in all the usual places. Bye.